Hello and welcome to Access Chat. Today I'm really happy to welcome Rachel Neiman, who is the CEO of Go On. It's uh, really exciting for me because digital inclusion is something that we're very really passionate here at Access Chat all about. And um, Go On UK, sorry. Um, have to get it right. So it's something that we're really passionate about. We're campaigning to try and make our world more inclusive. And Rachel is leading this charge in the UK. So Rachel, I'm really pleased to have you here. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about Go On UK and also um, the work that you're doing and, and how you came to be involved in it? Sure, well, it's a great pleasure to be here. So thank you very much for inviting me. So Go On UK is a digital skills charity and our aim is to ensure that everybody has the basic digital skills that they need in order to be able to succeed and prosper in what is becoming an increasingly digital world. And so what we're looking at is really the very basic entry level skills that people need rather than more advanced skills. So the reason that we're doing this is because there are 12.6 million UK adults, that's 23% of the UK population, adult population, who lack these skills. And that is a massive figure in this day and age. And we define basic digital skills into five different elements. So it's not just about being able to send an email or just about being able to uh, Google for, for some information. It's a more complicated uh, range of things. So managing information and communicating are two of those elements, absolutely. But then so is transacting, whether that's um, showing a whether that's um, doing online banking or online shopping or even filling in an application form online. It's problem solving, which could be, are you able to use an online help uh, and creating? Can you create a simple post? Can you create a CV or something like that? So the combination of those skills will make you digitally capable and literate for the 21st century. So we look at uh, individuals, we look at charities, and we look at organizations, small organizations, SMEs in particular. So we've got a very wide, uh, wide remit, uh, and the issue for SMEs and charities is equally, uh, is equally uh, severe, if you like. Uh, uh, 1.2 million uh, SMEs lack those basic digital skills, and 58% of all charities lack those basic digital skills. So this is a very, uh, a very uh, significant um, issue. I, I, can, I can imagine, especially since the charities and the third sector is what is becoming more and more relied on to deliver services. And there's a push for digital by default. Uh, Absolutely. Becoming ever more important. So um, what role does, what role does Go on UK play in, in working with those charities to, to help promulgate, promulgate those, those skills and, and those practices, the good practices. Um, you're absolutely right to point out the issues with digital by default. I think uh, one thing that people tend to forget is that the heaviest users of public services tend to be those who are more likely to be digitally excluded. So moving those services online means that the most heavy users of those services are least likely to be able to access them. So this is a real issue and a real problem. Universal credit in the UK is, uh, is a clear example of that. So what we're trying to do is to make sure that we have, we work through a whole range of partners, whether those are voluntary sector partners, whether those are private sector partners, whether those are public sector partners, because this is a thing, this is, this is an issue that affects all sectors. It's not just something that government should sort out. It's not just something the private sector should sort out. This needs to be a proper public-private partnership. So we want to work with as many, many organizations as possible through as wide a network as possible in order to get as many people upskilled as possible. So one of the things that we do is we focus on providing the consistent uh, standards, the consistent methodology, the consistent ways of working, the best practice to allow other organizations to do the work on the ground face to face with the individuals that need that need help. So whether it's through uh, digital champions, so getting organizations and charities to create uh, a cadre of digital champions to go out and help train 
people, whether it's through awareness raising and campaigning, uh, or whether it's through local organizations and businesses going in and buddying with other organizations to help them to gain those skills. There's a whole range of things that we do to help. I, 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 I know Deborah's got a question, but but before she she does, I've got I remember a stat from Philip Blonde at the National Digital Conference what two years back. Mm -hmm. He was saying that um, actually loneliness is uh, more damaging to your health than smoking, and, yeah. and, and and that really got me thinking about digital exclusion and and, and the the idea that you can move everything online actually is probably going to be deleterious for people's health and, and also potential or could potentially be it can also have massive benefits but it does but effectively it's a bit like squeezing a balloon you're making savings in one area and and and, and it goes just shifts to another place so um i think how it's handled and, and teaching the skills and also finding the ways to enable community uh, um, is really important. Absolutely, I totally, I totally agree with you. This is very much about locally led and community approaches because that's the only way this works. There is uh, no point in from some kind of central or national level dictating uh, a one size fits all way of doing things because it just doesn't work like that. So one of the things that Go on UK did a couple of uh, months ago, in fact last month, uh, was to launch its digital exclusion heat map. And the purpose of that was to show in every local authority area in the UK what were the key issues causing digital exclusion. And what we found is that it's not just about not having broadband or not just having not having the skills. There are social factors that are just as important as digital factors in identifying whether somebody is going to be digitally excluded. Yes. Deborah, I, I, I'll shut up now and hand over to you. No, no, a great conversation. And Rachel, thank you for being with us. We appreciate Pleasure. it. Pleasure. Um, I know that part of this problem, and that this is a very, very important problem, and I appreciate that you're you know, working hard on it in the UK, and I know that it's a problem uh, here in the United States where I am and all over the world, but I'm curious how or, or if your organization tries to address the um, it's sort of the, you know, how did people get access to the equipment that they need? What about Wi-Fi? What about the broadband things? I am here in Virginia and um, relatively close to our nation's capital here in Washington, D.C. And yet where I am in Virginia, um, we don't get very good Wi-Fi. So you would think the United States, we have, you know, Wi-Fi everywhere, but actually um, having access to broadband and really good uh, Wi-Fi is uh, problematic in a lot of areas, not to mention you start getting outside into the developing econo economies and stuff. So I was just curious about that part of it. Sure. I mean, that's exactly the same problem we have here. So, and that's partly what our digital exclusion heat map was, was, was there to show, that if you don't have the connectivity, it doesn't matter if you've got the skills, you won't be able to use the internet. Similarly, if you've got the connectivity but you don't have the skills, and you can't afford the devices to, uh, to, 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 to be able to use the internet and to use your skills, then you won't be able to do it either. So this isn't, again, a single binary issue. Just solving the skills problem is not going to solve the exclusion problem. You need to have the connectivity. You need to have the affordability. People need to be able to afford the hardware and the devices. And so what we're trying to do is to get uh, decision makers and policy makers to understand that these things are all linked, that just doing something like investing in super fast broadband, which is a big issue for our government over here, is not sufficient. There's no point in doing that if we're not matching that sort of investment with investment in skills and in affordable hardware. I agree. And we find the same thing when we're dealing, when we're digging into the issue a little bit more and we're looking at, you know, access for people with disabilities. And I know the United Nations is really trying to figure out, we have these amazing assistive technology all over the world. We've got the wearables, the Internet of Things, robotics, 3D printing. But how do we get this into the hands of the people that need it? And really, this is this multidimensional problem. It's something that um, I think that we need to solve as, as a world. And of course, 
maybe this is why we have some of the terrorist problems that we do, because we need to make sure that as many people as possible are engaged socially, hopefully in powerful, positive ways, but also education, access to education, employment. So this is, as you said, Rachel, this is about all of us, but we find that people with disabilities sometimes are unfortunately left out more than other uh, people as well. It's a troubling thing, but that's one reason why, you know, we're having these conversations. Um, absolutely. Um, and I think it's important that we really target what we're trying to do effectively, because again, previously, I think there's been a bit of a kind of one size fits all approach to digital inclusion. And frankly, we need to understand the specific constraints facing different groups of people under different circumstances, if we're going to be able to help them appropriately. I think that's, that, that's a great point. I, I actually looked at the heat map. Um, and, and it's quite interesting because I'm, I'm in an area of the country that is, I'm, I'm quite remote. I'm living in a village, but I'm well mm -hmm. connected. So I'm in, I'm in West Sussex, but West, uh, and West Sussex generally, or, or along the coast anyway, has really fantastic connections. I can get 4G, I've, I've got fibre, but it was an area of high exclusion. So mm -hmm. some of that's got to be the social factors. Absolutely. And the social factors we're looking at are age, income, education and health. And health, and under health we do include long-term disability as well, um, is a huge factor, as we found. So it is important to understand that the digital factors may all be in place, but if the social factors are, uh, are, are, are stacked against a particular population or particular area of the country, then that's going to have a huge impact because digital inclusion is very correlated to social inclusion and very correlated to financial inclusion as well. Uh, I think Antonio's got a question. Antonio, are you there? I can't, I can't see you at the moment. Yes, uh, yes, I'm here. Fine. Uh, no, you were, uh, over, over the last couple of, uh, couple of years, I, I've been involved in some um, digital inclusion in initiatives. And one of the, the things that, uh, that I was able to uh, get from the from the, from the learners is when I was asking them, have you been in have you been in any the kind of initiatives where you can actually were able to learn a skill how to learn how to use a computer, and most of the answers that I got yes, people wanted to teach me how to use Microsoft Word, but that was not exactly what I wanted to learn. No, I I, I want to learn how to make a phone call to Australia where the friend that was in school with me, you know, in, in the 80s or you know, when I was, she moved and now I'm alone at home, she's alone at home and we, I would like to be able to use Skype to communicate with her, you know, uh, half an hour yeah. per day. And sometimes, so the point is, sometimes we see that there's a, a push in order to create a standard training, a formal training, and sometimes the needs of the people learning are not, they don't exactly match that. Yeah. So I think I, that's, yeah. I, I completely agree with you. And I think that the point that I'd really like to make very strongly is that what we're advocating for when we talk about basic digital skills is not IT training. It's not about IT training. It's not about learning Word, how to, how to open a Word document. It's not about learning how to, uh, how to manipulate an Excel spreadsheet. It is about what is the outcome you're trying to achieve? What is it you want to do? And how does technology enable you to do that better, simpler, quicker? So it absolutely isn't. And I think this is, uh, this, we try to be very outcome focused. So what is the outcome that you want to achieve? And this is why digital is the enabler. Because otherwise you focus so exclusively on the technology, which frankly is the enabler rather than the end result. And if you focus on that technology, then you will put people off and people will think it's not for them and people will think it's too complicated. If the technology comes in almost as, as, as the secondary element, you're actually trying to do something and the technology is the thing that will help you do it, then people will be much less afraid of it uh, and much more confident in using it. No, I, I, I end up with questions of people you know, saying, okay, uh, this is the only device that I have to access the internet and they were showing me a tablet. So I only use this device to access the internet when I'm at home. And I struggle to identify and to have a separate level of trust when I do online banking. I'm not really sure if the email from my bank 
if I should trust on this email or not. I'm not able to understand that. I would also would like to have a good experience or to try to be effective when I'm using the mobile app of my bank when I'm, when I, when I'm using the device. So I don't need to go to the bank, I, but I, somehow I want to be able to make sure that I'm doing the right thing uh, without running any risks when I'm using my tablet. Yeah, I think, um, again, what we're trying to uh, do is make the definition we have of basic digital skills quite um, device agnostic. So it doesn't matter whether you're using a laptop, it doesn't matter whether you're using a tablet, it doesn't matter whether you're using a mobile phone, the same principles should apply. Um, and I think with apps, it's very interesting how apps have, uh, ha have, have gained popularity. And like anything, some are good uh, and some are not so good and some are safer than others. Um, and I think there is, uh, we absolutely need to increase education about the safety and security of anything that we do through any of these electronic devices. So that's why under our basic digital skills framework, safety and security run all the way through. So we talk about those five different elements, the managing information, communicating, transacting, problem solving and creating, but safety runs right across all of them. What do people need to do in each of those circumstances to keep themselves safe? And I think what I would say to anybody who's concerned about using an app is to go for, for, for banking, for example, would be to go straight to your bank and ask any questions. If there's anything that you're unsure about or unclear about or unhappy about, please do ask the question because they need to get that feedback that it's not immediately clear from the app that this is safe. Uh, and that's very important feedback for them to get. Okay. Um, I, I think that's fantastic. The, I'm coming at it from a slightly different angle. It is understanding how we can use organizations like yours to get the message across that ease of use is broken right now. And actually, it, it's becoming more broken. So um, when we're talking about digital skills, I know people with, with, that had the digital skills that were able to transact, and yet new iterations of applications come out and new design paradigms come about and suddenly you're removing the ability to do stuff you're removing the obvious affordances of buttons looking like buttons or or the the, the user interface is hidden behind the hamburger menu who's going to know at, yeah. at 70 80 years old what the hamburger menu m means so it's it's again i'm I'm, I'm not trying to pick on any particular organization, but um, really, you know, it's a first rule of customer um, relationships that you shouldn't make your customers cry. Um, <laughs> recent, I, I, I recently, actually, yeah, my wife was trying to transfer some money, make a pay <laughs> on a mobile app, and, and it reduced her to tears. <laughs> so, and this is a company that actually provides really good customer service through other channels. Um, but when it comes, they, they've, they've taken security to such an extent that you're required to use two-factor authentication five or six times during the process. So the experience is broken and, and, and then you're taking people that had skills and you're putting them off. So how can we use organizations like yours that have a, a big voice to, to try and help educate the, the people that are making these apps that there needs to be a balance? Absolutely. Um, so I think the key, the key kind of mantra for me is putting the user first and keeping things simple. So I think those are the two things that any designer of any new app or any new technology needs to keep in mind. You can be as clever as you like and you can create something as complex as you like, but if people can't use it, they don't get the customer experience that they need from it and it's not intuitive, then it's not going to be a successful service. And I think people do forget that. And that's why, you know, when we're certainly talking to, uh, to, to, to software developers and others, we do put the point, you know, how accessible is this in its broadest sense of the word to the people who are least familiar and comfortable using this type of interface? Because if the people who don't, who aren't used to using it, can, do find it intuitive, then it truly is intuitive. If the people who know what a hamburger uh, menu is uh, find it intuitive, well, that's not terribly helpful because they know it anyway. 
So we need to really to, to design around people who are the least familiar with, with this and it's very easy for us to find them. So people say we need some testers, we can easily find them. Yeah, but uh, but uh, sometimes that principle yeah, is applicable to some things like as simple as an icon that identifies an app where they just redesign the icon and then nobody, the user doesn't know where the app is and doesn't recognize that app as being the one that they were using. So oh, it's, it's important to understand, especially online, online, online banking, that uh, people, uh, elderly people they, uh, or people who, who are used to do a certain level, a certain type of practice, they get some level of, uh, they get comfortable with, with the tasks that they are doing and then a small change can just break all that. Yeah, completely. And uh, that's why I think, again, user testing and putting the user first is absolutely critical. Um, and we can't over, over egg that. I mean, that is hugely important. And I think all of us involved in technology and in helping people take their first steps online, let alone people who find it difficult uh, to, to interact online, we need to keep reminding them that not everybody is a rocket scientist. And not everyone needs to be a rocket scientist. <laughs> No, they no, they don't, and 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 I right. I, I think that the, the other thing that I I advise people that aren't particularly confident about uh, technology is make sure that you've got automatic updates um, for apps turned off because you <laughs> and and please don't press just because it, um, Apple's remind you know reminders or or Google's reminders are telling you they've got a new version of the operating system doesn't mean you yeah. have to take it. Um, certainly, where in, in situations like that where you're not, you know, you're only using it for a small amount of uh, transactions, say for for sort of contacting your your folks and and, and browsing and, and stuff like that, to to update can break the whole thing. It's like going out and and coming back home again and finding that someone's rearranged all of the furniture while you've been out. So. Um, the first thing I do when I'm working with my, my older relatives and, and, and other people that are not confident is turn off those kind of automatic updates because we can go through it with with people and and that's fine. But if you leave pe and people are, are, are on their own, they're isolated and they're reliant on these apps and they're not particularly confident, those changes of icons, the changes of layout, the, the hiding of the, the UI elements just so you can get some more screen real estate um, are real problems for, for a, a large cohort of, of the users that are most socially excluded. That's right, and I, th I think that's why uh, very simple tablets that strip back a lot of that stuff are really helpful and really useful. So the things that actually limit uh, what the what the device does to only the things you want it to do rather than constantly having little messages pop up saying you know uh, you need to update your Java script or whatever which is completely gobbledygook to most people nobody understands what that really means why should why should they get a, a, a pop-up saying that so I think you know very basic devices are actually much more helpful because they do what it says on the tin and they don't try and hide behind more complex interfaces yeah. Uh, we, we, have been, we have been talking about devices, people using experience, but in, in order for, for a project that one that you are running to be successful, you need to engage with people. I know probably, you know, you spend a lot of time you know, trying to make sure that you have people on board that are able to support in, in your initiatives. So can you tell us a little bit how you run that, how you organize and how you try to bring ambassadors in order to collaborate in all this? Yeah, absolutely. So we work very much through partners, through partnerships and through networks. We are a small organisation. There are only 12 of us in Go on UK. And uh, that means we, we rely on working through and with others. So we recently launched a project in one of the London boroughs in Croydon, which is called Go on Croydon. And that is very much a partnership aimed at finding out what uh, what, what approaches to digital skills learning uh, really work with different groups of people. So what we're doing is we are doing some very detailed, what we're calling deep dive projects with people like homeless people, with older people, with people with mental health problems, with different, different cohorts 
of groups who are traditionally uh, digitally excluded to see what really works well with them rather than just assuming that everybody responds well to a particular way of learning. So the aim of that then is to create real scalable pilot uh, and get some, some, some real findings so that we then have scalable pilots that we can roll out in other parts of the country. But all of that relies on huge community involvement. It relies on local businesses getting closely involved. We've had fantastic support from Croydon Council itself and, we're fine, and as well from, from our, our, our board partners and the other people that we work with uh, on a regular basis. There is absolutely no way anybody is big enough to solve this problem on their own. It is absolutely uh, a, a cross-sector and uh, cross-community uh, 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 initiative that absolutely needs to happen. So we've got a lot of hopes from this Go on Croydon pilot. Uh, we hope that it will give learnings that the rest of the country can, can use and can be replicated rather than people reinventing the wheel and wasting money and wasting resource and wasting time working out for themselves what works. Let's do something at, uh, let, let's get some pilots done, let's really have that evidence base and then let's get those rolled out in other parts of the country. Deborah, I know you've got another question. Well, more, mainly a comment. I, I think this is just so brilliant because um, there's there's so many people that are left out. And um, it's so one thing that I'm hopeful as you really try to figure this out in the UK and do your pilots and roll it out, that you'll share this information so the rest of the world can actually start following your lead. I mean, there's so much that we can learn from each other. So it's it's just such an important piece. Uh, completely. I mean, this is, you know, this is not unique to the UK. And we, you know, we need to join forces on, on, on what works. And it's funny you should mention that because just, just this afternoon, actually, just before um, we started this interview, I saw that um, uh, an organization in France had been, ha had published a, a, a blog about our, our digital exclusion heat map. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting to see the international interest and the international take up um, that, that, that some of these products have caused, because I think everybody is looking for the same answers. So we absolutely need to share our experience. Yeah, I, I think that inclusion in, in, in being able to use digital services has a, a huge positive impact on people's lives. If we look at, and, and most of it will be on mobile devices, whether it be expensive iPhones no. or, or cheap $100 um, Android tablets. Uh, if you look to Africa and you look to the information that people were getting through, even through text message, um, it, in terms of pricing, um, mobile payments, it has a transformative effect. So uh, it's hugely important, uh, particularly for um, just keeping people in touch as well, because actually, uh, again, the, the whole loneliness issue is, is really important. People with disabilities tend to be isolated through the fact that they can't, cannot necessarily be mobile and therefore uh, finding ways to communicate through digital channels can, can, can also be positive. So we talked about digital tyranny before effectively through uh, digital by default, but it's also on, on the flip side a, a really positive uh, Thing for, for people once they actually get to grips with with being able to use dig, uh, digital devices and, and learn digital skills. Um, absolutely, and I think that's that's a really th important thing to to stress, which is actually everybody has a passion, everybody has something they're interested in, and if you unlock that passion and then show somebody how they can find out about it and follow it and do it online, so whether that is about being sociable and talking to friends and creating new friends and uh, taking part in their local community, even if they are housebound or bedridden, um, or whether it's showing somebody that they can get the latest, whether it's knitting patterns or gardening information or whatever it might be, or sport um, online, it begins to make people see the relevance of it to their own experience. Because quite often people will say, well, that's not for me. I've never needed it. I've never used it. It's a bit too frightening. It's, you know, I don't have the confidence to do this. Um, it, it's just not for me. But once you make it relevant to them, they begin to realize that it's not something to be afraid of. And that actually it's something that's hugely empowering. 
Uh, we have been talking uh, about people, the, but uh, I think in, in some areas, in, in some locations, this may also impact business. Sometimes we have small business who are, you know, who are, who look at, you know, they able to read in the news and say, you know, new mobile payment system, you know, and then they realize, oh, I'm using the same register for 20 years. You know, I don't know what to do. So uh, what is the link that, that we have here? Yeah, so as I said um, earlier, 1.2 million SMEs in the UK, that's again almost a quarter of all SMEs, lack these basic digital skills. And quite often these are the sole traders or micro businesses. So really the, the organizations of, of, of one to five people, let's say. And these are, the, these are the organizations that could most benefit from the types of technology that can improve their effectiveness and their efficiency and their productivity. So one example um, that uh, that I sometimes use is a single-handed hairdresser in a high, in a high street. So she's cutting people's hair. She doesn't want to have to. She can't employ anyone. She can't afford to employ anyone. But the phone's constantly ringing, and every time the phone rings and she's in the middle of doing someone's hair and she can't take that phone call, she's losing a client. So if she was able to implement some type of very simple appointment booking system, for example, which can be very intuitive and very easy to find, then she wouldn't lose those clients. So it's thinking about what is the business problem that you're trying to solve? If you're a micro business, what is the issue affecting you? What is it you don't have time to do? What is it that you wish you had more resources for? And then seeing if there's a technology solution that would help you do that. And then again, you begin to, to, to prove to organizations that this is something that is relevant to them. And it's not about implementing hugely expensive major IT systems at all, um, but that there are things that can really benefit even the smallest of organizations. Okay, Deborah, you have one last point before we before we finish. Yes, I, you know, you. I'm so impressed with your work, Rachel, and uh, this is how we change the world. So I, and this is why we do Access Chat because we want to show the leaders that are really making a change all over the world and how we can all tie it together. But it, it's interesting as a a middle-aged woman um, and, and a technologist. I'm a technologist, I love technology, but there are times when it overwhelms me. And so I look at like my 90-year-old father-in-law who keeps getting spammed and, and he loses all of his data. And I think it must be so hard for him or my mother. And so I, I just applaud what you're doing because this is how we really start to change society in meaningful, powerful ways and, and let people be who, who they are, regardless of whether you're like my colleague, Rosemary, who was born with cerebral palsy and she, she doesn't have a lot of control of her body, but she's a brilliant woman that has something to say and a lot to contribute. So I, I just really applaud the efforts that you're making there. And I'm so glad that we can help shout out to the world, you know, that this is happening in the UK and then hopefully we can all learn from what you are doing over there. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate that, Deborah. That's great. Uh, and thank you, Rachel. It's, it's been great. I uh, wish we had more time to talk. Um, looking forward to the Twitter chat tomorrow night. So thank you very much and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.